Can somebody tell me what that means? What is a prime story? Story is not story. It's kind of a flashback. That would, that would be a bad one. Okay. He said it's a flashback, kind of a flashback. What does that mean? What is the definition of frame story? You have to use a, a, one story to tell another story. Yes, it's a larger story that has smaller stories inside it. So it's a, a narrative with many smaller stories inside it. How many of you read Canterbury Tales in high school? That was a frame story. How many of you have seen the movie Forrest Gump? It's a frame story. It's a story of this guy who's sitting at a bus stop waiting for a bus to go see someone very special. But then there are all sorts of little stories that are flashbacks inside that bigger story. The first story that we're going to talk about today is the Decameron, and it begins on page 1799 in your book. And the Decameron was written by this guy named Boccaccio. And Boccaccio lived in Florence, Italy, toward the end of the Middle Ages. And Florence, Italy was a hotbed of cultural and artistic achievement during, at the end of the Middle Ages. And he wrote this story, and this is important, so you need to write this down. This story, he intended for this story to, to show the fertile creativity of the human mind. Now, why is that important? Because during the Middle Ages, remember, the church was very powerful. They were the centers for learning. And they believed that reading for pleasure was a sin. It was the devil's work. And Boccaccio said, no, God created fertile minds to make stories to entertain people because he claims that he wrote this for people to escape the horrors of the plague. There were people dying every day. They were throwing their bodies out. You were afraid it was going to happen to you. So he said, you know, I'm going to make this story, these stories to help people forget about the fear of death, their fear of dying. So the frame story to this story is what I told you on Monday. It's the story of three guys and seven girls. They were young people, probably your age. And they are afraid they're going to die from the plague. So they go off in the country to somebody's country estate. So what do we know about them right away? They could go to a country estate. They're wealthy, yes. So they make up this real elaborate game where one of them is king or queen every day. And each one of them tells a story every day for 10 days. So how many stories would be in this collection? 100 stories. And again, you're gonna run across this again. You're gonna contrast this with something else later. So Boccaccio wrote this merely to entertain people, so he claimed. But you know scholars can't leave well enough alone. So as they study these stories, they have looked at each one of them and say, oh, well this story means this. Okay? So the first story of the first day is on page 1799, and it's the story of this guy named Sir Cepoletta, or Sir Ceparella. What was his profession? He was a notary, which is a lawyer, <coughs> okay? Now, a lot of people say crooked politician, that that's, that, that that's one and the same. A lot of people also say that about lawyers. And I want you to look on page 1801.
I want you to look in the first paragraph and give me some descriptions of this man. What kind of man was he? What sort of actions did he take? What are some qualities about him? He was a murderer. What else? Gambler. Okay, he was corrupt. Yeah, so he was a lawyer, yeah. I can say that my son's a lawyer and we make lawyer jokes all the time. They have lawyer jokes. What else did he do? He was a murderer. He was a, a gambler. He's crooked. He was a false saint. Okay. What does that mean, a false saint? Where does that say that here? In, in, on page 1801. What are some of the descriptions of him besides gambler, murderer? Okay, he treated women badly. He was also a womanizer. What else? Didn't go to church. He was blasphemous. What else did he do? A glutton, a great drinker. He was a robber. Says quite possibly the worst man who had ever been born. Yeah, he has a lot of bad qualities. So, these brothers said, come over here. We want you to do a hit job for us. So he said, gladly. I love those kind of jobs. So he went to their house. But when he got there, he got really, really sick. Like, deathly sick. So the brothers were like, oh no. What are we going to do? If we call the priest in for last rites, People are going to say, that man is terrible. Why did y'all let him stay in your house? But if we don't call the priest for last rites, people are going to say, y'all are terrible. You didn't let this man have confession and get his last rites. What are we going to do? So Sir Ceparella said, I got this. Get the priest. So when the priest came, he said, have you ever done this? Have you ever done that? And he said, yes, but... I did it for this reason. And he twisted it around to make it look like he was this great person. And when he died, the priest said, we've got to have a funeral for this saint, worthy of this saint. So they had this huge funeral procession, and everybody thought, oh, what a great man he was. And on page 1808, the guy telling this story, the very first story of the first day, makes this conclusion. The last paragraph before day two, story seven. Thus lived and died Sir Ciaparello, as you have heard, who became a saint. I don't wish to deny the possibility that he sits among the blessed in the presence of God. For although his life was wicked and depraved, it is possible that at the very point of death he became so contrite that God took pity on him and accepted him into his kingdom. However, since this is hidden from us, what I will say in this case on the basis of appearances is that he is most likely in the hands of the devil down in hell than up there in paradise. But then he said, God still grants our prayers as if we were asking a true, true, true saint to obtain his grace for us. All of us in, in this married company may, by his grace, be kept safe and sound during our present troubles. Let us praise his name. So, but Caggio's point in writing this, he said, was to entertain. But scholars have concluded from what this first storyteller tells us that God uses different things for good. Okay? He's using Boccaccio's fertile creativity of the human mind to ease 
human suffering for these people. Okay? So, he claims that he was just writing it just because he wanted to make people's lives less horrible during this horrible time. But this guy says, yeah, he might be doing that, but he's doing it really to further his cause that, yeah, people should be able to write creatively to entertain people. All right, then we're going to look at page 1824, day four, story nine. And it's the story of two knights, Guglielmo and Rossiglione. They were best friends. What did they share? Yeah, a woman. Okay? So, G guy was messing around with our guy's wife. And our guy saw him. They didn't know that he saw him, but he did. What did he do to him? What did he do to his friend? He killed him. Then he made a nice supper for his wife. What did she serve him? Mm. What did he serve her? Yeah, her lover's heart. And this is what she said. What did you think of the dish? In good faith, my lord, I liked it very much. So help me God, I do believe you did. But I'm really not surprised that you liked it dead because you liked it more than anything else in the world when it was alive. She said, what did you just serve me? And he, t she, he tells her. And she says, now that I've eaten such a noble dish made from the heart of so gallant and courteous a knight, God forbid that any food should ever pass my lips again. She ran out the window and jumped out and killed herself. Now what's the moral of that story? Don't eat, don't eat um, supper when you're partner kills your lover don't mess around on your partner uh, who knows it could be the story like Romeo and Juliet the lovers will be together forever and ever amen you don't really know what the moral of that story is but one of the one of the concepts that you should be seeing through these stories is that frame stories have different effects because there are different storytellers all right, let's look at the Thousand and One Nights. Now, I gave you the frame. Uh, uh, I didn't give you any inside stories. You read the frame story to this. And it is the story of... It is narrated... It's, the stories inside the frame story are narrated by what many scholars have called, or who many scholars have called, the greatest storyteller of all time. And that is Shah Razad. And there were two kings, Shariar and Shah Zaman. And their wives cheated on them, both of them. And they said, we are the most miserable people in the world. There's nobody worse off than we. So they were traveling around, and who'd they come upon in their traps? The demon, the woman walked in the yes, and the demon was asleep. And what did the woman want from the kings? To have sex with her. Yeah, they wanted. To, she wanted them to have sex with her. So she said, if you don't do it, I'm going to wake him up and he's going to kill you. So they did. Then what did she demand from them? Mm-hmm. Give me your rings. I've got a collection over here. Why? Why did she want their rings? Just because. Just because I can get them. Ha, ha, ha. So then Shahriyard uh, said, uh, there is somebody worse off than us. You know, women are awful. I think I am going to marry a different woman every night and kill her. And uh, marry a different woman every day, sleep with her, and then kill her. Well, all the women were being used up by this horrible thing that he was doing. So his butler's daughter said, I'll take one for the team. And her dad said, no, you can't do that. You'll die. She said, mm, I've got this. So, here we see.
the audience isn't interested in what I'm saying, it walks away. But if your audience isn't interested, you're dead. I thought it would be easy, but it isn't. I must lost it before I got started. I've told you before, the first moments are vital. I paused at a good point, with the thieves sneaking into Damascus to kill Alibaba. Sneaking in how? In what? A wagon. Too ordinary. It has to be something more exotic. You're starting your story again. You have to hook your audience again. How? I was walking last night past the great mosque in the street of Sion. Exactly an hour after sundown, when I came face to face with death. Had he come for you? You see? You're hooked. He's still insane, Anil. So, Shahrazad slept with the king, and her sister was under the bed. And her sister said, Sister, if you're not too sleepy, tell us a story. So she told the story, and she got to the very best part, and she said, I'm tired now, I'm going to sleep. And the king said, Ah! I've got to hear the rest of this story. She said, I'll tell you tomorrow. So we let her live. And she did the same thing for 1001 Nights. And the collection of stories in there, some of them may be related, some of them may not be. But in both sets, they always go back to the main story. Shahrazad keeping herself alive, and the ten people in the castle staying alive for another day as well. So, there is, author has a uh, special reason for uh, doing that, and we'll talk about that on Monday. Um, you do have a journal, and it asks you to look at the effects, but we'll talk about